All right. Welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I am going to have the CEO of Your Financial Pharmacist on, Tim Ulbrich, who uh, I will let him introduce his details or where he is currently. Uh, but I've met him a couple of times and uh, just somebody who has dedicated really uh, much of his outside work life to helping uh, students and pharmacists and residents to have a great financial life. So Tim, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. Thanks, Tony, for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, could you tell me just a little bit about yourself, any background that you want to share, uh, especially as it relates to residency? Uh, most of those that are listening to us are going to be future residents, current residents, or maybe are PGY2 and, or looking for a job right now. And then how uh, you've had residency in your life and then the, some of the residents that you've talked to on your podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So short, short bio is a uh, pharmacist by training, uh, graduated from Ohio Northern University, go polar bears, uh, did, did residency in community ambulatory care at Ohio state and have been in the academic world for about 12, 12 years now after falling in love with teaching during my residency, uh, experience and, and really having an opportunity to explore many different things during residency, which is one of the great advantages of, of doing a, a one or two year residency program. Um, and have kind of evolved that, that career to pursue some entrepreneurial interest, both on the academic side, entrepreneurial interest and growing programs, starting new initiatives. And then in the work of, of starting uh, your financial pharmacist, where I serve as a co-founder and CEO. And we're, we're really on a mission, as you highlighted, to help as many pharmacists as we can, pharmacy professionals, student pharmacists, pursue their path towards financial freedom, however they, they would uh, define that. And we can certainly get into more of that as well. And for, for me, you know, residency re really personally was uh, an important year of exploration. You know, one of my mentors, uh, recent Remington uh, Medal Award winner, Mary Alice Bennett, my residency program director, uh, was really instrumental in my experience as a resident, but also in my nudge to go into residency. You know, I had found myself in my final year of pharmacy school burned out like many uh, students might, especially during this year, right, with the COVID uh, pandemic and what what those students are experiencing. And I had just finished an international rotation opportunity at Kenya, uh, had just gotten uh, married, had had a, a extensive uh, variety of, of appy experiences that really pushed and challenged me. And I just got to a point of like, I'm ready to graduate. I'm ready to be done with, with this whole thing. And thanks to some good mentors and others said, hey, Tim, I really think you should think about residency. And this was much later in the process. And I would recommend any student consider it this we're, we're talking like late November, December, you know, last minute decisions. And, um, which is part, partly why I'm so passionate about advising people to be early on in this process and be prepared. Long story short, landed at a great program in Ohio state, had some great mentors, really explored clinical practice, got to explore teaching progressive ambulatory care models. But that year of exploration really led to the next step, which was, okay, I love teaching. Uh, and I want to explore that further, which led to the next step of, I really love more of the academic, academic administrative work. And so I think that year of exploration was so critical for me. And I think so critical to what I hear from many residents or those pursuing residency and many of whom we, we've had as guests on the YFP podcast. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the finances of, of being a resident. And my experience was quite a bit different where I uh, matched with my wife at the same time, but mm -hmm. I was a decade out of school. Uh, and that's when uh, I did it. And it was during the financial crisis. So yeah. any job was actually a good job at the time, but uh, that residency allowed me the time to kind of explore if I wanted to do teaching and I ended up uh, teaching in a community college. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to ask you first was the very first thing that I think many of them think is look at the student debt load. Yep. Look at what's going on. And, you know, everyone right now who has stock that has anything to do with the Dow Jones is a genius as the, the markets continue to rise every single day. The green line is just there every single day. Uh, people are getting loans forgiven or there might be some loans forgiven and mm -hmm. they might have this FOMO fear of missing out by actually being in residency mm -hmm. where they'll exponentially grow as a clinician, but the rest of the world will seem to be passing them by. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, maybe investing for the long term uh, in terms of residency. 
Yeah. And I, I appreciate Tony, the, the investing, uh, example here in reference, as we think about career, career investments. And, you know, I, I think back to my experience, $31,000 was my resident salary in 2008, oh, 2009. <laughs> uh, so they, they've come up, right. We've seen an increase. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I would actually argue today that divide is, is not as significant as we have seen, you know, salaries, uh, remain somewhat stagnant in some cases decrease and resident salaries come up. Right. So that, that FOMO is certainly still there, but I think it's perhaps not to the same degree it was. I, I remember feeling that in a significant way. And I, I think a couple, you know, words of advice here would be, you know, really thinking about the long play, the, the long picture, the long-term goal in mind. And there, there's lots of good information resources. I've done some research in this area, looking at the value of a one year of a community residency, which was my background. And what does that mean for career opportunities and goals? And what does that open up? And it opens up a whole lot in terms of opportunities, but also it opens up a lot in terms of, you know, folks looking at things like career satisfaction and upward mobility of their, you know, degree over time. And I, I think one of the challenges we have as pharmacists is that generalizing here is that often we see folks come in at a entry level position and the upward mobility of both role opportunities and of salary may not be there. And, uh, you know, one of the advantages I think of a residency program, depending on which path you go, is that you're beginning to open up other doors. And even within those doors, you're opening up some options of where you may be able to grow. And one example I think of is, you know, I, I serve as the program director for the MS HSPA L program at the Ohio State University. And that's a two year combined PGY1, PGY2 MS degree. And, you know, those graduates, certainly a big investment of time, right? Two years, PGY1, PGY2, master's degree, a couple that's hundred commitment. thousand dollars of yeah. debt, you know, not making, you know, significant salary. But what we see of their career paths is really significant. And so, of course, this is an individual decision for everyone. And I think that pressure, you know, student loan debt is real. What we saw class of 2020 median debt load of $175,000. That's a big number, you know, and, and, and obviously we're, we're in this time period right now with administrative forbearance, which has lightened that load a little bit. We're seeing some glimmers of hope with loan forgiveness and other things that are out there. But I think that if we can tie the career plan and really keep the long-term plan in mind and also match that up with a good sound financial plan which is more important, you know, important for everyone, of course, but especially those that are pursuing residency where you have a lower income time period that we've got to be able to set that plan so that we can, in the long run, be able to succeed and take advantage of the career progression that we hope to see. Tony, I'll say I have a theory. I have no evidence to support this. So you can, <laughs> you, you can debate me on this, but I have a theory from personal experience and talking with many pharmacists that even though you're sacrificing income for a year or two, I would make a case that many of those folks end up financially better in the long run, not necessarily because they are going to out earn peers in the long run, although that may be true because of the comment I made around upward mobility, but because I think it forces you to begin to learn some behaviors and patterns that have a long-term benefit, right? Because if you go from zero income to a hundred, $120,000 of income, you know, that that's a big jump and, and there can be challenges with learning how to manage that expenses can go up quickly. If you go from zero to 45 or zero to 48 from a P4 student to a PGY one, you know, you're forced on some level, hopefully to figure out like things like, Hey, I've got to set goals. I got to work on my budget. You know, I've got to really hunker down on this emergency fund. And so I think there's in some level, it can feel overwhelming. I think the more opportunistic way to think about that is this is a time period where I can really begin to set some important behaviors and habits that will benefit me long-term with my financial plan. You have always been a glass half full person. And I think you, you would call yourself that. That's right. And, and yep. I think that uh, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, which is, all right, well, let's stop thinking that I lost this money from uh, what I'm going to get versus uh, what I'm getting in the future. And, and both my wife and I did the community route and I ended up with, I've been a, a, a professor for over a, a decade. Uh, and then she's uh, been with the VA and is now in academic detailing. So I, I don't, I think that you're absolutely right in terms of mindset uh, and those kinds of benefits that come from residency. Well, let's talk about actually affording the residency itself. Um, We'll start just very briefly about the actual cost. I have seen too many times students submit four residency applications because that's what comes with it. Mm. And I guess if we were going backwards, like, okay, so we, we start at the very beginning with a $200,000 budget. 
and then we spend one hundred and ninety nine thousand six hundred on the schooling and four hundred <laughs> on the residency application process. Mm -hmm. And it just kills me to hear, well, I applied to four. I was like, why did you apply to four? Well, because that's what we were allowed. Good gravy. You know, the, mm -hmm. the average pays, the average student uh, applied, I think, to 11 or 10.5, something like that last time. Can you talk a little bit about investing in that first process? You had uh, a show, episode 175, about reducing costs during the residency application but yeah. maybe at least reducing the cost so you can get a couple more applications in. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on the episode you mentioned, we had Dr. Sarah Cummins, a PGY2 emergency medicine resident at University of California Davis Medical Center, who had some great input, pre-pandemic input, on you know some strategies that any one of them may not seem very significant, but when you're traveling, you're going to events like mid-year, lots of interviews, you know, some small things and hacks that you can do to help control that cost. And I will say, Tony, I'm a big fan. You got to invest in, in, of course, to pursue that opportunity. And you know, I think this is an area where folks might be somewhat short-minded, uh, short, short-term minded in terms of you know, four hundred versus six hundred dollars. When what that could mean in terms of opening up more interviews and opportunities. Um, but we also have got to keep the finances in mind. And so we've got to find the balance of these. And I see too often the financial rails fall off in the fourth year or in the final year. And lots of reasons about, you know, for this, we see often uh, tuition and fees go up in that final year. People are moving for rotations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We, you know, <laughs> moving other things. So, you know, I think even anticipating some of that, the reason I mentioned that is anticipating some of that and being ready for that and trying to budget for some of that, I think can then allow you to be able to plan for some of those residency experiences and making sure you're making in the investment in that as you're suggesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You know, the four applications that come with, with the forecast process, you know, I know from my work for several years working with students to be competitive applicants, while every student is different. And part of this is you've got to really do a good self-assessment get some good mentors, understand, you know, what your position is as a candidate, uh, what are the types of programs that you're applying to, uh, how, how have you done in terms of networking and making connections, you know, obviously somebody that had a really strong app rotation at a site versus somebody that is, you know, cold calling, if you will, that site, very different, right. In terms of what that one application means. Um, and, and same thing on the networking side, you know, I often tell folks that like, the application, as I'm sure you've talked about on this show, the application should not be the place in which they learn about you as a candidate. If, if that is true, we have missed opportunities along the way in terms of being able to network and build some of those connections. So I think there's a whole lot of strategy that even comes before the applications, before it comes in the investment. But once you get to that point, I know from personal data working with them that, you know, on average, and I don't know what the latest data to, Tony is, but, you know, eight to 10 applications, in some cases more. Uh, in terms of folks that are going to have to have enough in the queue to yield enough interviews, which then obviously increases the likelihood that somebody's going to match and match at a position that is a good fit for them. I've worked with students that have submitted two uh, as, as high as tw <laughs> tw 21, 22, and success has you know been different for the reasons that I just mentioned. But your point is a good one. You know, if we look at two hundred thousand dollars of debt, this is not the time I think where we say, oh, we're going to save you know, 50 bucks or a hundred bucks, but how can we really invest to make sure again, if we're thinking about where might this open up the doors for the long run? So what, what are you seeing, Tony? You're in this more than I am today in terms of like average number of apps yielding enough interviews. What, what is that data today? Um, it actually, I'm going to do the Tim Baker. It depends. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, there's actually a little formula I put together where you look at the person's college of pharmacy match rate um, versus for interviews or for uh, the actual match. And then you kind of look at where they are. So uh, if the average is 11 and you're right at the average, you know, with the hundred and let's just say there's 150 schools there aren't, but um, so like in Ohio state, a student would probably only have to put out six or seven uh, applications to get maybe three or four interviews uh, because they have a little bit over a 70% match. But if you're in maybe one of the lower quartile, then you mm -hmm. would really be looking at those 20 applications uh, to, to get that. But many times it's, it's not just stamping out as many as you can. It's like you said, you have to do the research to say, okay, well, let me just go look and see where people were accepted before. Mm -hmm. And the one tip I would give uh, you know, your, your YFP listeners is um, that 
it is very regional and it is absolutely you, you'll look at some places and you're like wow they only took from a single college of pharmacy and that might be because they only have appe relationships with those colleges or you look like at hopkins who says we only have these six schools that we bring into our you know longitudinal program and then half of the residents are from those schools so it i hate the tim baker depends but it depends it totally depends well, let's well not, and that's let's where dwell on <laughs> those numbers yeah. I do want to go into, um, did I cut you off? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go for it. No, no. I just wanted to talk about the, I just love the living in the van episode. Yes. So I just, yes, yes. just trying to get to this. Uh, so, um, but Rena Crawford, who was a PGY2 resident, I think in San Diego, uh, had a little bit of an alternative way of dealing with the $2,000 a month per person rent in in that area and mm-hmm. uh, the real estate market is absolutely exploding so it's near impossible to find a home um an affordable home on the coast i guess you would say mm-hmm. but tell me a little bit about what she did and and what we can take away from her approach we don't have to def- definitely do the same thing she did but maybe from her approach uh to residency and and the cost savings yeah, she's really a rock star. One, one of my favorite episodes of, of 2020 is episode 152 on the podcast. And, you know, one of the things that we see is pharmacist salary, resident, non resident, you know, generally does not um, increase proportionally with what we see of cost of living, right? So may, maybe an ambulatory care pharmacist in, in San Diego might make a little bit more than a pharmacist ambulatory care in Ohio. But I can assure you, generally speaking, it's not going to be at the level of what you see differences of cost of living. And here we're talking about San Diego, uh, where Rena was doing residency, one of the highest cost of living area parts of the country. Uh, and she really had a, a creative approach, you know, taking matters into her own hands, realizing how high the cost of living was in San Diego while she was doing her PGY2 living on a resident salary and decided that she was going to buy and renovate an old van for $7,000 and live in it. Um, and we talk on the show about like, what does that practically look like? You know, where does she get Wi-Fi? Where is she parking? What about safety? Why is she doing this? And I shared her story because, you know, as you mentioned, the goal is not necessarily for folks to hear what Rena did and say, I'm going to go do exactly that. Maybe some people will, um, but really to hear it as a creative concept. You know, I think sometimes we get into this fixed mindset of, you know, I'm going to go do residency and I'm going to sacrifice for two years and then I'll worry about all the financial stuff later. And Rena really took a much more, you know, uh, intentional approach of saying, okay, I don't want to just delay my financial plan for two years. I've got some big goals in terms of attaining financial freedom. I don't want to fall further behind during these two years. And if I can build momentum during these two years, then when I graduate and finish up, you know, and hopefully end up living maybe in a cheaper cost of living area, I'm going to have all that much more momentum into the future. And one of the things that impressed me besides just how awesome the uh, interior work and design is of what she did and, and what it looked like is that her mindset was something that I found contagious and something that I know will provide her long-term success. And her mindset is what I just referred to. Her mindset is I'm going to continue to be intentional, even in this time period where I've got factors and forces working against me, right? I mean, if you just look at the numbers of what rent would cost in San Diego relative to a resident salary, even if you think no taxes, you know, coming out from an income, her rent would have been over $2,000 a month per person where she was looking to live. And you think about a resident making maybe mid to high forties, my goodness, like what would be left right after all of that? So, you know, her, her creativity, her mindset, what she did uh, and, and why she did it, I thought was really incredible. And, and she had some great insights to share on that show about her desire for more of experiences and not things, which really lines up with well, in terms of what we see from the literature about you know what really derives happiness in terms of how we spend our money and what we do. And so experiences were important for her, being able to see parts of California and travel and being able to do that while keeping cost of living down and while not further derailing her financial plan. So what a great a uh, story that she had to share in one, one of my favorite episodes of 2020. Well, let's then talk about uh, a little bit about how a resident might have a, a side hustle during uh, the residency process. Um, I think Allison Brennan was one that you interviewed. So maybe we could talk about her and, and what she mm-hmm. did in terms of uh, moving things on, though. I think she was an established pharmacist, but mm-hmm. the principle is the same. I think with a side hustle, you, you start maybe 
by making a thousand or two thousand a month uh, as kind of a first step, just to mm-hmm. proof of concept, I guess is maybe a, a way to put it. Um, can you talk about maybe her story or just the stories in general of those kind of going into uh, let's go gaming here with the level leveling up to uh, level right. one or level two of the the side hustle, where we kind of just start getting a little bit of extra money to make things just that much mm-hmm. easier. Yeah. And I think your comment, Tony, about leveling up is, is an important one. And I think sometimes folks, you know, that are trying to get started with a side hustle, look at examples that are out there, pharmacy or non-pharmacy and, you know, are, are overwhelmed or think, you know, how, how might I get there? And what about that? And forget that for many of those folks, that's been multiple years of a journey, right? You and I have been on this journey for a long time yeah. Uh, yeah. and, you know, it's taken time to grow. We're still learning. We're still growing. Uh, but you start somewhere, you know, a few hundred bucks, thousand bucks, you know, and, and I think really taking a step back to say, what's the purpose? What am I trying to do? You know, I think one of the values of a side hustle, which is probably what people often think about would be additional financial dollars, which in residency would be really helpful to be able to afford cost of living expenses, make sure you're not going in further debt, perhaps make progress on student loans, achieve other financial goals. I also believe one of the advantages of side hustle, besides the financial piece and the diversification of your income, which is important, is also pursuing something that provides you uh, an area of passion, of interest, of joy, something where you feel like you can perhaps create on some level, provide value depending on what you're doing. And that may not be as monetary, but could also help, especially if somebody's in a, a challenging period with their work or other things, that they are energized and are, and are enthused by the work that they're doing on the side hustle. So I think it's important folks don't lose that side of it as well. You know, Alison Brennan's story is incredible. What she has built, you mentioned, you know, not from directly from a resident, she uh, has been a manager in a health system, still is working full-time, although I'm not sure how long that will last based on the success of her company. So Emma Jean and Co, uh, skincare, uh, natural skincare company, really incredible story of her vision, why, what motivated her, how she built it and how she uses her pharmacy skills and background to help her succeed. You know, her, her story really jumps out to me as one of somebody who maybe very quickly has seen success. Uh, but, but there's many others that we've had on the podcast of folks that, you know, are doing things like medical writing and getting started, you know, with something like that. Uh, you know, so a wide variety of what folks may be doing. Uh, we recently had on the show, Kareen Wong, uh, on episode 194, who has a company called My Guiltless Treats, uh, which has really a great example of somebody who took their clinical experiences, saw a problem that needed to be solved and was able to take the clinical experiences and working with patients with diabetes and really translate that into a food product uh, that filled the gap in the market and has had success in doing that. Uh, and has it been able to really grow that while also controlling the growth to make sure that she keeps her priorities and her personal and professional why in mind as well. So I I think I would encourage folks, you know, there's definitely different levels, right? There's, Hey, I'm going to get started and just derive some income from something besides my W2 income, whether that's something like medical writing, you know, different opportunities that are out there. You see pharmacists doing, you know, different things from, from writing books, um, to, uh, consulting services that are out there, uh, pharmacist, who's a comedian and motivational speaker, you know, there's, there's lots, lots of different ideas that are out there. And so I think hearing those stories and learning from those and then saying, okay, what, what are, what am I interested in? If I'm looking at a business or side hustle, ultimately, what problem am I trying to solve and where can I get started? And one of my, one of my favorite books is start by John Acuff. Because, you know, he talks about this concept, which for for me reading it when I was starting YFP was so important that we can often get paralyzed by what about the website? What about the marketing plan? What about this? What about that? And ultimately the idea never gets off the ground. And his encouragement is like, just start, you know, start moving something forward and you'll learn from that over time. Don't, don't be reckless, of course, but start, get going, learn from that experience and grow. And, And I think about the beginning of YFP a little over five years ago, you know, I was looking at some old logos and websites that. I built and probably had no business like building a website. I just shouldn't have been doing that, but I needed to get things off the ground and it's evolved and it's taken a life of its own. Uh, But without some of those early steps, obviously things may not have moved in the direction that they have. So yeah, I, I think the, the getting started, you know, really identifying what are some other examples out there that you might learn from and draw from, uh, and then not being paralyzed necessarily by folks that you may look at that have been doing it for five, seven, 10 years and say, Oh, you know, I'm not sure I can do something like that. And therefore never get started in that journey. Well, I, 
I actually, you know, we, we kind of covered those, those things that I, I wanted to cover in terms of uh, the, the three kind of steps where you, you start into, you know, just getting a good budget or being mindful of your spending, then getting maybe a smaller side hustle and then maybe a larger side hustle. Mm-hmm. But what I wanted to do is maybe ask you a little bit about the, the program that you have at Ohio State. Something that we rarely talk about are the PGY1, PGY2 combines uh, in administrative. And I had uh, two of your residents on actually talking about yeah. burnout, uh, one in hospital burnout, one in community burnout. But I think that as people are going to go to the uh, match on Friday mm-hmm. and they're going to you know learn their results, some of them may have avoided the two year because they, they just weren't sure. And they were maybe mm-hmm. a little bit concerned about that kind of commitment. Can you tell me a little bit about the two-year residency? Because I feel like that's one that we just are like, well, that's for those MBA guys, or <laughs> uh, that's not, yeah, I think they do like a clinical year and then they, they do some like an administrative longitudinal or something. I, yeah. I don't think people really know what that encompasses. So could you talk a little bit about that two-year program and, and kind of that what it is to commit mm-hmm. to 24 months instead of 12 months. Yeah, that's a good point, Tony. Is it is a big commitment. And my experience, you know, working and coaching P4s and in the residency process, that that's exactly what I would, you know, see often is I'm not sure I've had enough experience. I don't know if this admin management thing is for me. And I feel like I'm, you know, perhaps getting too narrow, too early in that option. And so I think this goes back to some of the conversations we've had about exploring areas of interest early. You know, if, if you think admin or management might be an area of interest, you know, trying to identify how you can align rotations, internships, other things that help you explore what do you like, what do you not like? Do I like the idea of leadership and management, but really realize maybe it's not for me? You know, those are things that are helpful to identify before you commit into a two-year program. But essentially what these programs are, they're combined, typically combined master's programs and residency training. So for example, the program at the Ohio State University College of Pharmacy, at the end of two years, they complete a PGY-1, a PGY-2, and then they get an MS degree that is specialized in health system, pharmacy administration, and leadership. So it's a big commitment of time, right? You're completing two years of clinical residency and you're completing a master's degree, typically 30, you know, 35 credit hours type of a thing. And you're balancing both of those at the same time. And, and programs operate differently. So some programs have the coursework that's you know all front-loaded. Others divide the coursework between the two years and balance it out a little bit more. You know, Others really hold true to a PGY-1 and a PGY-2 experience, where others are a little bit more flexible with how they work that around the academic type of experience. You know, Some align longitudinal admin management rotations with the coursework some may not, and not all coursework is created equally. So some might be a master's degree that's specifically focused in health system pharmacy admin, like the program we have at OSU. Some might lean on an MBA program or an MHA program or an MPH program. And that's an important thing for candidates to keep in mind is that, you know, what, what of those degree options may be the best fit for you and for the career goals you have going forward. Obviously I'm biased to what we're doing at OSU, but I firmly believe that We want to focus on training folks to be health system pharmacy managers and leaders, as that is where the vast majority of them will stay for their entire career. And the small subset of them that move on beyond the pharmacy department to say the executive level of the C-suite, you know, I believe there's further training that can be had and or experiences at that point that will carry them. So looking at programs to say, you know, what, what type of coursework, is it an MS type of degree that focuses in health system admin training? Is it more of an MBA that I'm looking for? If so, what, what gaps might exist? Is it an MPH or an MHA? But generally speaking, you're looking at two years of residency, a master's degree and a training path to prepare you to be in a pharmacy management and leadership role. So just to give, you know, folks, some examples of roles, I'm looking at some of the positions from our class of 2019 and 2020 uh, at Ohio State of our degree program, roles that people took in terms of supply chain managers, medication strategy specialists, 340B program coordinators, inpatient centralized operations managers, uh, pharmacy managers of sterile compounding and operations, 340B and revenue cycle, inpatient clinical manager, pharmacy manager for home infusion. So that's just a sampling of types of roles, but you know, back to my comment earlier, Tony, one of the things I see with this group is that their opportunity for growth 
is really significant because obviously the role that they start in, you know, um, a mid, mid, mid level manager role, many of them may go on to be a director of pharmacy, chief pharmacy officer, or perhaps beyond that. So this is one of the areas I see in our profession where there's fairly significant upward mobility over one's career. Well, I've asked you a ton of questions. Uh, is there anything that I've maybe missed in terms of asking or uh, any final pearls that you have in terms of really matching? And, and you've talked about this uh, over and over again on, on YFP and, and the podcast, but really matching your financial plan to the goals and the things that you have for life. For example, my kids could care less if I'm working at the top of my license. They only care that I'm there in the afternoons coaching their soccer in the spring and fall and that I'm always <laughs> there on the weekends and I'm there to put yeah. them in bed and so forth. So my personal goal was not to be the, the best clinician I can be, we will be maybe for somebody else. Mm -hmm. But can you tell me a little bit about that final kind of matching lifestyle to financial goal? And then how does YFP do it? And then how can they get in touch with you in terms sure. of uh, maybe starting that process, uh, as John Acoff would say? Yeah. Well, one of the things that we talk about a lot with, with our clients, but also in the community at large, we're talking about the podcast is the importance of identifying what the vision is, what the purpose is, what the why is. And, and this is true for the financial plan, but this is true for career planning and for how your career balances with your, with your personal life as well. And so we believe, you know, when we talk about the financial plan, we believe early on, we've got to understand where are we going? Why are we trying to go there? And what's important? Otherwise, we're going to be following a path that might not have a purpose or a vision or a reason of what we're doing that. And that sounds like common sense, but you and I both know, Tony, especially with young families, time can go by like that. And if you're sure. not intentional with how you're using your time, how you're spending your money, what you're prioritizing, year, decade will go by and you'll say, okay, I need to course correct. And so we talk about the importance of finding a personal financial why and a purpose and vision through which then decisions are made, right? So when we talk about handling student loan debt, when we talk about buying a home, when we talk about investing for the future, when we talk about making a career move, we should ideally be thinking about that in the context of, okay, how do we evaluate that knowing where we're trying to go as we think about what success might look like in 10, 15 or 20 years. So I think for the residents listening to this, the prospective students listening to this, really evaluating where do you want to go? Not where does somebody else want you to go? Where do you want to go? And why is that the target? And we fast forward 10 or 15 or 20 years, as nebulous as it may see in the moment, how would we begin to define success? Because that's going to become the vision through which we then start to make other decisions and ultimately allows us to hopefully achieve that goal in the long run. So that, that's a key piece of, of what we're doing. And you know, one of the encouragement I would have for Tony, for, for your listeners is we talk a lot in pharmacy about networking. And I think we do a not so good job about talking about, well, what does that look like? How do you do that? You know, what's really the, the, the art of networking, the science of networking? We know that it's important, but how do we do it? And how do we be intentional about that plan? And David Burkis, we had on uh, the episode uh, on the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast, we had on episode 116, He's the author of the book called A Friend of a Friend, and, and his academic career is on studying networking. And I would highly recommend that book. It really opened up my eyes in terms of moving from I know networking is important to understanding, you know, really where is valuable networking? What does that look like? How could I consider it? How do I make that just a part of what I do every day? Not when I just perhaps need it or need to lean on my network. And I think that's a valuable resource that the, the listeners hopefully would find uh, helpful as they're navigating the beginning of their career and making this important transition into that first decade. But if folks have questions for, for me, uh, yourfinancialpharmacist.com, uh, lots of great information uh, there. You can reach out to us at info at yourfinancialpharmacist.com. We would also love to have uh, listeners as a part of the Your Financial Pharmacist Facebook group, which is a community of, of more than 7,000 pharmacy professionals over the across the country that are really helping one another with financial questions, encouraging, sharing wins, helping through challenges, and really just a great community uh, that is, is empowering one another. Yeah. I mean, you, your commitment is, is 100%. Very few businesses target negative net worth. Um, mm -hmm. uh, those that are really struggling with their, uh, you know, the loans and all of that, because you've taken such a long-term approach that you know that 
as you grow, as they grow, you'll grow and succeed. And, and that's happened over the last, gosh, how long, how long since the beginning of the blog? So that was your yeah. very first, right? No, November 6, 2015 was the first blog. Wow. Wow. So yeah. five years, it's in five years. Well done. Okay. And then I know that also um, if somebody's really, you know, kind of at that point where they want to uh, meet with you guys one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. uh, they can do some kind of a planning call with you. Uh, what yeah, about they can those just that go to maybe graduated and maybe uh, in that position? Yeah. If you go to yfpplanning.com, they can learn more about our comprehensive planning services. Uh, and we, we do a free discovery call with Tim Baker and myself to see if that's a good fit for uh, them in terms of what they're looking for, for financial planning. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, for those that are in that phase of, Hey, I just want to absorb as much as I can, obviously the podcast, the website, the resources we have there. Uh, but for those that, that are ready for that next step, yfpplanning.com, you can book, book that discovery call. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Tony.